So it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker, Dr. Chad Farrell. Uh, he's Associate Professor and Chair of the Department of Sociology at the University of Alaska Anchorage. He earned his PhD in Sociology from Pennsylvania State University in 2005 and teaches courses on demography, research methods, and urban sociology. His research focuses on urban inequality, and he has published works in journals such as the American Sociological Review, Demography, and Urban Studies. He's currently collaborating with researchers at Penn State and Cornell University on a project funded by the National Institutes of Health, which assesses the changing racial and ethnic contours of US society since 1980. I imagine after this election, there's probably a lot to write about. Um, there will be moving forward. Uh, and so a lot of people probably don't know here, but I'm actually an alumni from the University of Alaska Anchorage, and Dr. Farrell was one of my professors. I took his urban sociology class, and ever since then, it's scarred, I mean, influenced me greatly uh, in looking at urban landscapes and suburban areas uh, wherever I go. And uh, instead of just reading off the accolades of uh, what Dr. Farrell has been doing, uh, I thought it would be interesting to hear what some of his former students had to say. Uh, so I contacted some of our cohort. Um, I would say that our cohort was a very interesting group of people, very diverse backgrounds, um, I think relatively un, uh, uncontroversial, but maybe a little bit sometimes, and uh, came from all over um, great places like Canada, uh, and uh, from the metropolises of Oklahoma to Soldotna, Alaska. And so anyway, what a few of them had to say about uh, Chad is, or Dr. Farrell, uh, is that starting with uh, Brandon Walker, he said, Dr. Farrell completely heightened my awareness and opened my eyes to the complexities of urban sociology. He is one of the most genuine professors I've ever had, and I miss taking his class. Uh, Dr. Farrell doesn't just teach you facts in which you memorize for a test and then remove from your memory. He is providing you with the knowledge that you can and will be used in everyday life. From Jordan Love. Uh, demography is an essential element of social science research. Your data is only usable if you know exactly who it represents. Dr. Farrell clearly presented the importance of rigorous demographic data collection and representation while opening students' eyes to the creative ways Demographic data can be used to tell the stories of our communities. Pay attention to his figures and charts. You'll want to copy them in the future. Uh, quote, I've used the demography assignments as a template for many projects in my life, from Erica Mitchell. Uh, demography was one of my favorite classes, and Dr. Farrell teaches it in such a great way. Each day was a new topic of excitement for him to teach us, and always get a feeling that he was genuinely passionate about uh, what he's teaching. That was from Megan Mascagno, formerly Simmons. Uh, Dr. Farrell changed the way that I looked at the cities around me. I remember both classes uh, he taught the most because of his enthusiasm and passion for the subjects he taught. I really like that he used real world situations to teach us about uh, demographics and urban sociology from Sarah, Sarah Schrader. Uh, Professor Farrell's demography class provided me with a conceptual starting point for looking at how society shapes and is shaped by the geographical environments in which it is intimately embedded. For that, I am grateful, Cody Edwards. Uh, and the last uh, is, is more of a word to you, the audience, uh, from one of our more eclectic graduates, Clayton Dale. Uh, and he said, I've never seen anyone get excited about demography as Dr. Farrell. Now buckle your seatbelts because he's about to geek out, possibly. So with that, please welcome Dr. Farrell to the University of Calgary. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you, Kent, um, and thank you for having me here today. Um, it's back home in, in Alaska. It's our spring break, and uh, I don't think I made it quite as far south as some of my students, um, but I'm very delighted to be here uh, today. And uh, as Kent mentioned, today I'll be discussing some research that I've been doing over the past five years uh, with some uh, researchers at Penn State and Cornell University, uh, assessing the the changing racial and ethnic contours of US society, and I'll be focusing on Anchorage, Alaska. But stepping back for a moment, just to, 
just need to acknowledge uh, you know, the terms urban and city are not terms that usually come to mind when you think of the Arctic. Um, but in fact, the Arctic and the subarctic uh, are urbanizing. Uh, and you're seeing larger and larger percentages, proportions of the population in the Arctic and subarctic residing in dense urban settlements. And of course, Anchorage is one of the largest urban settlements in the, in the, in the uh, subarctic. And as cities have for millennia, cities have been magnets for different types of people, a diverse array of people. Um, and they have been magnets for diversity. And today I'll be talking specifically about ethno-racial diversity in, uh, in Anchorage. And because I'm from Alaska, I am legally obligated uh, to start with a quote from Sarah Palin, our former governor. Um, and this, this quote was from uh, a previous presidential campaign when our, our former governor was running uh, for vice president. And this quote about Alaska being a microcosm of America wouldn't be in the top 10, probably not even the top 20 most controversial things she said during that campaign. Uh, but this, this statement did generate a bit of controversy because pundits pointed out, well, how can you claim uh, Alaska as a microcosm of America when in fact it has such uh, low levels of, of racial and ethnic diversity, such small uh, Latino populations and African American uh, populations. And I thought this would be, at the time I was relatively new to Alaska and, and still getting familiar with the demographics of the state, but I thought it was a, an interesting inroads into, okay, where does Anchorage, or where does Alaska uh, stand in relation uh, to some of the demographic changes occurring in the United States? And specifically as an urban sociologist, where does Anchorage fit in, in that urban continuum that we see across, uh, across the nation? So my goals uh, today are, are going to be to look at Anchorage specifically, but in the co using a comparative uh, uh, framework. You know, w where does Anchorage fit in in terms of uh, racial and ethnic diversity compared to some of the national uh, trends in the United States? As a demographer, um, I'm relying primarily on data from the uh, U.S. Census Bureau. Uh, the, we uh, collect. Uh, we c conduct uh, decennial censuses, so every 10 years, I think it's every five years in Canada. Uh, so I've, I've, uh, I'm relying on uh, the uh, enumeration, the counts for uh, the racial and ethnic uh, questions on the U.S. Census. And I have that right here. We collect data on race and uh, ethnicity in the United States in kind of a clumsy fashion. There's two questions. The first is the so-called eth the ethnicity question, which is essentially asking about Hispanic, uh, or Latino uh, origins. And then there's the race question, uh, which uh, has this, uh, um, a combination of closed-ended and open-ended uh, options for respondents. But it boils down to basically white, black, um, uh, American Indian, Alaska Native, uh, Asian, or Pacific Islander, and uh, then this, this some other race. Uh, so if, if, if somebody sees this menu of options and, said, and thinks, well, I don't belong in any of those boxes, uh, they, they can uh, check uh, some other race. Uh, prior to 2000, uh, respondents were essentially forced to make a single choice. You had to pick a team. Uh, there was only a, a monoracial uh, option. From 2000 and, and into 2010, the most recent census, uh, uh, respondents have been given the option to choose more than one race, so to choose a biracial or multiracial uh, identity. So these are the, the, the data that I'm relying on. Um, and this allows me to kind of create or um, si six broad uh, ethno-racial groupings in the po that represent the entire population. Uh, and um, the reason why this isn't quite as refined as the, as the previous slide, if you, you saw that there, were, there was some uh, more refinement and open-ended uh, items in the, in the previous slide is when you go back in time uh, with the U.S. Census, the measures for race tend to get cruder and cruder as you go uh, back in time. So when I go back to 1980, these are roughly the groups for which I can get consistent definitions over time. So when I'm assessing long longitudinal change, I want to I want to stick with consistent definitions. So I'm kind of stuck with these six groups, uh, white, uh, African American, uh, Latino or Hispanic of any race, Asian Pacific Islander, Alaska Native American Indian, and then this other category, and then this other category is going to be 
supplemented to after 2000 with those, th those people who identified uh, more than one race. Uh, so, so, and I'll call it the multiracial uh, group. A couple things to note here. I use the, I, I use the, the rather clumsy term ethno-racial. Uh, I do that uh, to kind of underline uh, the fact that, that notions of race and ethnicity, these are social constructs. Uh, these are cultural constructs. In some cases, they're political constructs. And at, in terms of identity, they're psychological constructs. So they're fluid, they're flexible, uh, they're not biological categories. Uh, I also want to acknowledge, uh, because I'm relying on these broad uh, groupings, I'm missing a great deal of diversity within each of these groups. So for example, our Alaska Native population, uh, within the, I'm, for the sake of the analysis, I'm treating the indigenous population in the United States as uh, a group, a single group, when in reality, if, if you just look at our Alaska Native population, incredible level of geographic diversity, cultural diversity, linguistic diversity that's going to be missed by just treating that as a, as a single group. And the same goes for other groups as well. I will delve into this diversity within d diversity or this internal heterogeneity a little bit, uh, a little bit later. So how do we measure demographic diversity? And uh, this could be done not just with you know, ethno-racial counts. Uh, th this could be done with any meaningful uh, social grouping. Uh, it could, you could look at occupational diversity in the local economy, for example. You could look at linguistic diversity, religious diversity, um, age diversity, income diversity. Any meaningful social group could be um, useful for this sort of analysis. I'm going to be focusing on ethno-racial uh, diversity. So um, when we think of demographic diversity, diversity has, you know, it has two primary uh, dimensions. First is number of groups. Uh, so the more groups in, in a population, and that could be a national population, it could be a state or province, it could be a community, it could be a neighborhood, it, be, it could be a school. The more groups present, the more diverse the population. And then also their size relative to one another. You have to take that into account when assessing diversity. Uh, and, and the example that I usually will use is, you know, consider three different neighborhoods. Uh, you have one neighborhood, the first neighborhood, it's, let's say it's an all-white neighborhood. There aren't many all-white neighborhoods left in the United States, but there, there are still a few. That would be a neighborhood that has no ethno-racial diversity. I mean, it, it might have other forms of diversity, but no ethno-racial diversity because there's only one group present in that population. Then let's take a second neighborhood uh, that has white households, but let's say it has African-American households and Asian households and Latino households and native households. Uh, that group by definition is, or that neighborhood by definition is going to be more diverse than that first neighborhood because there are multiple groups present in the population. But let's say it's still 85% white. Uh, so it's, it's more diverse, but it, there's still one group that is predominant uh, in, the, uh, in the population. And then let's take a third neighborhood that has all of those groups present, but they're of similar size to one another. Um, that's a neighborhood that has a, a great deal of demographic uh, diversity. And this diversity index that I use is uh, useful in that, it, first of all, it's, it's, it's intuitive because it has, ha ha has a nice truncated set of values from zero to 100. Uh, zero would be that first neighborhood, that, that all white neighborhood, or an all black neighborhood, or all Latino neighborhood, a neighborhood that, or, or a geographic unit that has no ethno-racial diversity. Uh, then 100, uh, in, in my six group case, would be a neighborhood in which uh, all of those groups are of, of identical size to one another. So that's maximum diversity in a six group case. And then uh, between zero and 100, we have a, a continuum of values to allow us to kind of capture all the, the potential combinations of group sizes within a neighborhood or a school or a community uh, or a state. The, um, the index that I use uh, is called the uh, entropy index. Uh, it's it's uh, um, been around for several decades, but it takes into ac account group proportions. Um, and it uh, ranges from zero to the natural log of the number of groups. You divide by the maximum, multiply by 100, and you get that nice clean set of values from zero, uh, zero to 100. But this allows for, for me to uh, quantify the level of diversity in a population. So we'll start out with, with Anchorage. Uh, so how, how diverse is Anchorage uh, compared to other cities in the United States? And I'll be using 
um, the most recent uh, census data uh, from, uh, from the 2010 census. And here we have um, these pie charts are depicting uh, the uh, ethno-racial composition of Anchorage and Oakland, California. Um, I don't, you know, w with these six groups, and I don't think you need to look at this very long, and I, you certainly don't need to do a, a sophisticated dem demographic analysis to realize that Oakland is more diverse than Anchorage. Um, you know, this is a very, very diverse uh, 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 population in Oakland, California. Um, Anchorage, uh, it's a majority white population, but you'll see uh, the other five groups are, th are there in significant numbers. Uh, and I'm not talking in terms of statistical significance, but they have some demographic heft to them in terms of their, their relative size. Uh, si their size is relative to one another and the white population. Anchorage actually scores a 70 uh, out of 100 on this six group diversity uh, index. And that puts it, uh, ranks it at, at 103rd among I was looking at over 700 cities in the United States. These are cities of at least 50,000 uh, people. Uh, and there were about 700 or so of them uh, in 2010. And um, so that puts Anchorage um, in about the 85th percentile among uh, US cities in terms of its overall level of, of diversity. I notice Oakland uh, scores an 82 on this, uh, on this index, and it's ranked second uh, among US cities. I think, I think Vallejo uh, in California is ranked number one for, for 2010 at least. Notice that Oakland is, does not reach that maximum level of diversity and you, you can see um, its uh, indigenous population is very, very small and its diversity index you know, is at its maximum when all groups are, are of equal size. So if you have parts of that pie chart that are very, very uh, tiny, uh, you, you're not going to approach that maximum level of diversity. But this is a very high level of diversity, a no majority uh, population in, in Oakland where no group is a numerical uh, majority. Then a little bit closer to home, uh, for me at least, is Seattle. Uh, and here you see much uh, more similar uh, ethno-racial compositions uh, between uh, Anchorage and Seattle. But note, uh, Seattle scores a 60 on this diversity uh, index uh, and has much lower ranking uh, than Anchorage. And uh, the properties of this diversity index that I'm using um, kind of come out here. You know, if you look at, at Seattle, uh, you have some, um, um, among the, 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 the white population looks pretty similar in terms of its relative size. And if you look at the, the, uh, the other groups, the one group that really sticks out is the native population, the indigenous population. Once again, um, as, you know, Seattle has a very, very tiny uh, native population. Anchorage has a very significant native population. So in this case, you know, the, that diversity index is gonna be higher for Anchorage because there are more groups of similar size to one another in the local uh, population. Then if we look at, at changes, uh, changes over time, this, this goes back to 1980. Um, so uh, if you, the blue line here, the trend line is Anchorage. Uh, the green line is the west, western, the average for the average western city in the western region of the United States where Anchorage is located, of course. And then the red line is the average for all U.S. cities on this diversity index. And you'll note first the, trend, the trends are consistent. You know, they're upward across the board. And in fact, our analyses have indicated that this has been nearly a universal trend in the United States. Nearly all communities in the United States, whether they are large urban centers, whether they are smaller communities in the suburban ring, or whether they are rural communities, or, or Arctic communities. Uh, virtually all communities have become more diverse um, over this period. The small number of, of communities that have become less diverse over this period usually were those communities that were extremely diverse in the first place and really had, were kind of hitting the ceiling and had nowhere to go but down. Uh, so this has been a, a universal trend across communities. Now some communities are much more diverse than others, but the, the trend has been upward. What you'll see with Anchorage is um, back in 1980, Anchorage was slightly more diverse than the average U.S. city, slightly less diverse than the average Western city. But over time, you see, you see a, a, a great deal of acceleration in diversity in, uh, in Anchorage. And in fact, it starts to pull away from the pack uh, once you get into the, uh, into the 2000s. Uh, there are a couple things going on here. You know, what is fueling this rapid increase in diversity in, in Anchorage? 
Uh, one is um, rural to urban migration of the native populations in, in Alaska. Uh, so, so during this period, you see a great deal of, of growth in the indigenous population uh, in Anchorage, and much of that is fueled by migration from rural areas. Um, secondly, a very rapid increase in Asian population uh, in uh, Anchorage. Uh, it tripled uh, over this period in size. Uh, this is due to, in part, domestic migration uh, from the lower 48 uh, and also immigration. Uh, thirdly, I mentioned this before, there was a change in how the census does business. So between 1990 and 2000 is when they changed from forcing you to choose a single racial identity to allowing for um, a multiracial uh, identity. Um, and that's where you see some of this surge because many residents of Anchorage have opted for a biracial or multiracial identity. So in the previous slide, that, that orange slice of the, of the pie got much bigger between 1990 and, and 2000, and that was because pe of people changing their, their identities in terms of their reported identities on the, on the census. And then some of this has to do with um, uh, natural increase. Uh, with, we have age differences uh, by race in the United States and, and, and Alaska. Uh, many of the, um, the, the white population in the United States is aging. Many of these other groups have a much more youthful profile. Um, young adults tend to be the ones who migrate uh, from state to state or engage in country-to-country uh, uh, -country migration. Uh, young adults are most likely to be migrants. Uh, Alaska has traditionally attracted migrants, and young adults also happen to be a childbearing age. So if, if many of your migrants uh, are not white, um, they're going to be more likely to be having children. So some of this has to do with natural increase in the, uh, among certain segments of the population. So a combination of migration, immigration, changing identities, and natural increase accounts for this acceleration. Okay, so up till now I've relied on these, these crude ethno-racial um, groupings. Uh, I, I thought I would take a look at some of that diversity within diversity. And um, what the census does between decennial censuses is it carries out what's called the American Community Survey, uh, which is a, um, a probability survey, a probability sample uh, that uh, has a much longer list of questions. It's a much more detailed and refined uh, questionnaire. And one of the questions, uh, rather than kind of checking a box, one of the questions on this um, American Community Survey asks, people about their ancestry or ethnic origins and allows them to fill in whatever, you know, however they, they define themselves. And this allows for a much more refined look at kind of the, the composition of the local population of Anchorage. In this next slide, I have a list of, and this is just alphabetical, uh, I, I chose all of the, the uh, ancestry and ethnic origin groups uh, that uh, were at least the estimate were at least estimated at 500 people or more in the community. The, the actual list is much longer than this, but I've already got too much going on in, on this slide. Um, but this, this shows the largest uh, groups. And uh, you get a range, when you give people the option to fill in a blank, you get a much more diverse, uh, shall I say, uh, set, of, uh, set of responses, which range from um, very, very broad sorts of origins, like African or Northern European or Scandinavian uh, to, um, or American uh, to much more uh, specific uh, kind of national origins, you know, uh, Filipino, Finnish, uh, Japanese. Uh, and then of course, um, we have uh, a number of our Alaska Native uh, uh, cultural groupings, tribal aff affiliations, uh, Athabascan, um, Aleut, uh, Klingit, um, Yupik, uh, et cetera. Uh, so this gives you a sense of kind of the, the diverse array of, of, of groups within each of those broad ethno-racial groupings that I, I had identified uh, previously. Now th this, you know, this includes U.S.-born and, and foreign-born individuals. So that, you know, people identify as Filipino um, there's been a Filipino presence in Alaska for like 200 years. Um, so, so, so people who identify as Filipino could be people who've been in Alaska for generations or somebody who was actually born in the, uh, the Philippines. So you have a, a, a broad a, a array of, of people within each of these, 
these groupings. If we look solely at the, the immigrant population of Anchorage, and this is shaded according to, uh, to region, you'll see that um, uh, Asia is kind of the predominant uh, source of our immigrant population. But even within the Asian uh, region, there's a great deal of diversity of origins there as well. Uh, Philippines is the largest uh, uh, origin group, but of course we've got uh, people from Thailand, Laos, uh, Korea. Um, and then we also have uh, you know, a great deal of diversity outside of Asia uh, from Latin America, uh, Mexico and the Dominican Republic are the two largest. Uh, Western Europe, Canada of course, Can uh, uh, Canadian born uh, residents of Anchorage uh, are in the top 10 of the uh, uh, origin groups within the Anchorage uh, population. So in many cities, about one in 10 residents in, in Anchorage is foreign born. In many cities that have significant uh, immigrant populations, they're often dominated by a single origin group. But with, with Anchorage, reflecting the diversity of the, the broader population, even our immigrant population is extremely diverse in terms of its, of its uh, national origin. Okay, I was, so we've been at the kind of the macro level or the community level. Uh, I thought next we could look at uh, the neighborhood level. Uh, so drill down to a, a smaller uh, geographic unit. So how diverse are, are uh, the neighborhoods of Anchorage? And here I'm using uh, what are called census tracts. Uh, census tracts are the census, they're, they're administrative units that the, the, the census uses. Um, they're typically, they aim for about 4,000 people per census tract. In reality, they range uh, from about 2,000 to 8,000 people. Um, in urban areas, population densities are such that 4,000 people, uh, that, that usually gets you a geographic unit that is somewhere close to what most people think of as neighborhood, you know, at that, that level of geographic scale. So I'll often use uh, census tracts as a proxy uh, for neighborhoods. So I did a, a similar diversity analysis, S same six groups, uh, but in this case, census tracts rather than uh, cities. And there are roughly 70,000 census tracts in, in, uh, in the United States. Uh, this is a, this is a census tract map for down, downtown Anchorage. Um, number 11 there, that is essentially downtown. Uh, and then the three tracks that are gonna be of, of interest, uh, just the un universities in 16.02 there, the, the three that I'll be focusing on are number six, uh, 9.01 and 8.01. And number six in particular, that is a neighborhood uh, called uh, Mountain View, a neighborhood in, uh, in Anchorage. And what's nice about Mountain View is that this is a case where the census tract boundaries almost match perfectly the, the actual boundaries of the community council area of, Anchor, or of Mountain View. Uh, community councils in Anchorage essentially serve as a liaison between residents and, and the mayor's office. So this, in many cases, census tract units don't necessarily, the boundaries don't necessarily match up with localized knowledge and localized definitions of neighborhoods, but in this case, census tract six actually matches up with of how local people identify and define uh, this Mountain View neighborhood. So I, I did this analysis of 70,000 census tracts and uh, for 2010 data, and here's the top 10. Uh, and you'll see very, very high diversity indices here in the high 80s into the mid 90s. And Anchorage, um, is home to three of the three most diverse census tracts in the entire United States. And track six there, that is that Mountain View uh, neighborhood scoring us 96 in this diversity index. So we're, we're approaching maximum diversity. And in the six group case, that means six groups of identical, uh, identical size. Uh, Seattle's uh, also include, uh, there's a census tract in Seattle that's also included on this list. And then the rest are in New York City, in Queens, New York City. And Queens is, has a reputation for uh, for diversity as well. Uh, the reason the Anchorage uh, tracks um, score so high, you know, all of these neighborhoods are very, very diverse. Uh, Anchorage gets the edge on these other, particularly Queens, because Queens doesn't have a very large native population. Uh, it has a very, very diverse population, but there aren't a lot of um, uh, uh, Alaska Native or American Indian residents there. So it scores a little bit lower in this diversity index because in these uh, Anchorage neighborhoods, that's a significant slice of that, uh, of that population. 
I should also mention, you know, one group that's not usually associated with diversity, the white population, also fe features um, an important role in all of these neighborhoods. Uh, because if you go further down the list, there are lots of diverse neighborhoods in the United States that don't have any white people in them uh, because of, of racial and residential segregation in the United States that, that remains to this day. And the white population is the most segregated population uh, in the United States. So the, the white populations in these neighborhoods are not majority white populations, but they're, they're a significant part of the mosaic of, of these neighborhoods and th that you don't always see in very, very diverse uh, neighborhoods and urban areas. So to give you a sense of what Mountain View looks like, here I'm using more recent data. This is from the, the American Community Survey. So this is from 2015. Um, uh, so this is not the decennial census. I'm always cautious about using the American Community Survey data at the tract level, which is the furthest to the right. It's a probability survey, so there are margins of error. Uh, there's sampling error involved with probability uh, sampling. I'm not so concerned about that at the, at the national level, but once you get down to these census tracts, you're getting pretty small sample sizes, so the, uh, the margins of error are pretty wide. Um, but I thought I'd throw this up here, um, and this is actually data pooled over five years to, to reduce some of, those, uh, some of that sampling error. So this is 2015, but it's actually 2011 through 2015 pooled over that five-year period. And you can see here, you can get a sense. Um, oh, and one other thing I've done here is I've separated uh, the Asian and Pacific Islander population. The Pacific Islander population will include Samoans, Tongans, um, Native Hawaiians, and essentially Polynesian, Melanesian uh, populations. I, I had them aggregated in previous analyses, but that's because back prior to 2000, the census aggregated them, and I couldn't disaggregate them. Uh, but I thought it would be useful to, to uh, separate out those two groups and give you the most refined picture that I could. Uh, and you can get a sense here why Mountain View scores so high on this diversity index when you compare it to the local area of, of Anchorage and the United States. You can also get a sense, if you look at the, at the U.S. chart there, how unlikely you are to see a neighborhood like Mountain View anywhere in, in the United States because of the, the, there are large differences in group sizes uh, across these, these various ethno-racial groups. So it's a, it's a, um, it's a confluence of geography and history and economics and migration uh, that has led to this extremely diverse residential area. Um, now I'll take a look at schools real quickly, uh, public schools. And this, this uh, I was prompted to do this by a parent in our local school di uh, district who had heard about my research and heard about Mountain View and asked, you know, basically sent me an email and asked, well, does that mean my kid goes to the most diverse high school in the United States? And I emailed him back. I said, well, I don't know, but I can find the data. And, and these are using uh, U.S. Department of Education data, and they collect data on race and ethnicity, ethnicity in much the same uh, fashion. And I did, uh, a, this, this was a seven group uh, analysis. This was a case where I separated uh, the Asian and Pacific Islander population um, which I didn't do in the earlier analyses because of limitations with past uh, census data. Uh, but it's basically the same sort of analysis, zero to 100. And here's the, the list of, uh, did the same sort of analysis, the list of the top 10 high schools. There are roughly 18,000 high school, public high schools in the United States. Um, and uh, sure enough, that parent was correct. Uh, his child did go to the most diverse high school in the United States, and that's East High School in Anchorage in uh, followed by Bartlett and West uh, High School, all of them scoring um, above 90 on this seven group uh, diversity index. Um, a picture might be useful here as well. Uh, this is, this is uh, from a recent editorial in our local paper that some high school students wrote. This is a group of students that are from those three high schools, from East, Bartlett, and West High School. Um, and they are part of a graduation task force. They're trying, you know, they're trying to increase uh, graduation rates in, in our uh, local schools. And I think you can get a sense from the picture, you know, this is what these, this is what these schools look like in terms of their, their, their composition. And over half of these students were born and raised in Anchorage. Uh, these are, they've known no other home except, except Anchorage. These are Alaska kids. And then you have a smatter, you have, uh, I think one of the, the kids here is born in the Philippines, one in Gambia. Uh, and then a couple uh, born, in, uh, born in Thailand. But this gives you a sense of the, the great uh, high levels of diversity in our high schools. If we look at our middle schools, much the same picture. Um, 
the five most diverse middle schools in the United States are found in Anchorage, and six, uh, six of the uh, top ten are found in Anchorage. Uh, one thing I didn't mention, you know, the, the schools that I'm not focusing on, you can see the western region of the United States um, uh, represented here, Hawaii, Washington, California, uh, Nevada, um, the western region of the United States is, is, a, a, is the most diverse region uh, of, of the country. And then when we get to elementary schools, uh, it gets very dramatic. Um, this is the top 20 uh, ele uh, elementary schools in terms of diversity in the United States, and 19 of the top 20 are all found in the, uh, in the Anchorage uh, School District. And th this also underlines something else about demography um, in the United States and, and Canada as well, for that matter, is, is uh, diversity increases as age decreases. Uh, so our, our youthful age cohorts, cohorts are our most diverse uh, age cohorts. And you can actually even see this within our school system, that our high schools are extremely diverse, but our middle schools are even more diverse than that. And our ele elementary schools are even more diverse uh, than that. And this is, this is a pattern you see throughout the United States, but the highest levels of diversity you, you see in our uh, elementary schools. So uh, Anchorage ranks not at the top, but relatively high in diversity compared to other American cities. Uh, it's diversifying more rapidly. It's accelerating more rapidly than many American cities in terms of how, uh, how it's diversifying. And then we have some of the most diverse neighborhoods and high schools uh, in the nation. So really, so when I think of diversity, um, you know, a lot of effort went into this, but it's really the easy part. Quantifying diversity is the, is the easy, uh, easy part of this. Uh, and this sort of analysis as a sociologist generates deeper questions that cannot be addressed with demographic uh, data. Um, because we don't experience, I've given you a kind of a bird's eye view, but we don't experience diversity uh, through a pie chart. Uh, we experience diversity on the ground, uh, in public spaces, in classrooms, uh, we experience it in workplaces, in houses of worship, you know, that's where it is experienced and negotiated. And, um, and, and then there's a the question of what are the consequences of, of localized diversity. And I, I do not want to give the impression that we've achieved some kind of post-racial utopia uh, in Anchorage, uh, given our diversity. Uh, in fact, uh, there are those who don't, uh, who haven't embraced uh, the, the diversity, the, the changes that we've been experiencing in the state uh, and uh, locally. Um, so this is, oops, this is um, a mailing from a few years ago from a, a, a senatorial candidate, Joe Miller. Um, I, I received this mailing in, in the mail, and it features over on the left there uh, pictures of, of young, tattooed uh, Latino uh, men. And uh, the, 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 um, the statement on there is, if, and if 20 million illegals vote, you can kiss the Second Amendment goodbye. I'm the only candidate who favors voter ID. Um, there aren't 20 million undocumented um, migrants in the United States, first of all. Um, they do not vote uh, in, in large numbers. There's no evidence that they vote in large numbers. And I'm not sure what the argument was about the Second Amendment that's the right to bear arms. He was making an argument that these illegal immigrants were invading the country to uh, take away your right to bear arms in the United States. I never got the argument, but there, it's clearly an inflammatory set of, uh, set of images. And it's really unfortunate. Uh, Joe Miller is a combat veteran. And um, if you look at the demography of, of, of Anchorage, one of the largest concentrations or clusters of young uh, Latino men and young Latino, uh, Latina women, for that matter, is on their military bases. Uh, they're, you know, they're serving their country, um, and they don't look, look like that. But this is you know, some of that inflammatory rhetoric. And this is, you know, this is, a couple, this is well before Trump. You know, this is, this is a, a couple years ago. Um, more recently, also before, before uh, the, uh, the recent discussions and debate, about refugees in America. Th this was uh, before the uh, presidential election. This was a, uh, these uh, Sudanese refugees had their cars vandalized, uh, their tires were slashed, and there were uh, messages scrawled on their, their uh, cars, um, go home, leave, not welcome here. Uh, this was a very ugly incident uh, locally. I should say the community rose up in support of the, the refugee population in response to this, but it happened. Uh, this happened in our, our diverse community. And very recently, um, 
one of our uh, elected assembly members uh, was on her, has a radio show and Facebook page, and she was peddling one of the latest conspiracy theories about uh, Muslims uh, uh, caching weapons out in rural areas, uh, and she essentially implicated that one of the um, local community members uh, was in, engaged in this activity. Um, and uh, he, he's an you know he's an electrician. Uh, he's well known in in the, uh, the outlying communities. Uh, he's actually run for state office. And these pictures are you know the, the assembly actually invited uh, him and his his wife in to, to the assembly to confront the assembly member about some of the statements that she had made about the Muslim faith and and about the, the, these sorts of conspiracy theories that were swirling around. So we're not immune to the same sorts of vitriol that we see elsewhere in the United States. Uh, and not everyone is. Some feel threatened by the increasing diversity that we uh, that we see locally. On a more um, and we and uh, in that same vein, uh, we've seen a cycle of protests uh, since uh, President Trump's uh, election, uh, and these are all uh, from uh, Anchorage, and uh, these are all focused on uh, the uh, the, uh, the refugee ban uh, that uh, President Trump uh, recently put in in place. So you're seeing the same sorts of, of of protest uh, that you're seeing elsewhere in the United States uh, up in Anchorage. We may be geographically isolated, but, but we're affected by many of the same sorts of policies. Um, on the brighter side, there are some in our community that, that have you know, embraced our, our diversity. And this is from a wonderful uh, news story from a couple years ago uh, where the reporter uh, took a look at the local soccer teams in the high schools. And um, you know, he was struck by you know, just how diverse these, these soccer, because soccer is an extremely diverse sport across the globe, extremely popular, but our teams, uh, you know, are extremely diverse in their own right. And this team right here, this is Bartlett High School, this is, this is one of those, the high school that scored second below East in terms of uh, diversity in the United States. And the, the quote there, we're all mixed up and that's what makes us stronger. Um, the gentleman in the middle there, La Yang, was quoted as saying that. He was talking about his team uh, and the diversity of his team, but I thought it you know, was a, an effective statement about our community as well. Anchorage is all messed up, and, or mix, mixed up, well, it's messed up too. Um, and that makes us stronger. And in fact, I used this quote as an epigraph for a, a chapter I wrote for a, a book that's coming out on, that's uh, um, celebrating the Anchorage uh, centennial. Um, and uh, our mayor, uh, Ethan Berkowitz and First Lady Merrick Himmel have also embraced uh, the diversity and they've, they've actually um, made uh, Anchorage part of a coalition of U.S. cities, uh, the Welcoming Cities Project, uh, that, um, whose goal is to embrace uh, immigrants and refugee populations uh, and their contributions. And they've also put some numbers on some of the economic contributions of immigrant and refugee uh, populations. So for example, uh, in Anchorage locally, uh, immig our immigrant populations have extremely high levels of self-employment. They're very entrepreneurial. Uh, they contribute uh, a great deal to our uh, GDP, uh, locally speaking. Uh, so there are some, some real practical economic benefits uh, to attracting uh, diversity. And, uh, and, and Related to those practical benefits of, of being a welcoming city, you know, we're suffering from a recession in Alaska uh, due to you know, uh, low oil prices. And we have experienced now our third consecutive year of net out migration from the state. So we're, we're, more people are moving out than moving in. And that has not been the case for, for many years in Alaska. Alaska has often, there's been lots of population churning uh, in Alaska traditionally, but we've typically been a magnet, not a repellent, uh, and the recession has made us more of a repellent. Uh, so this sort of movement uh, of, of welcoming people, you know, cities are in competition with one another for people, uh, for human capital, and people can move. Uh, cities can't move, uh, or, or can't move very easily. So they are in competition with one another, and it's in Anchorage's best interest to be, become a welcoming city because we need the people. Uh, we need, and, and it, especially in this current era of uh, net out migration from, uh, from the state. And then finally, I'll leave you with this. This is one of my classes at the University of Alaska Anchorage. Uh, this is a typical uh, introductory level uh, course. Um, this class, if I'm remembering, we have well, we have students from you know, very, very rural, rural uh, villages. 
uh, to students who were born and raised in Anchorage, to students that are from the lower 48, to students who were born uh, outside the United States. Uh, this class in particular, we had African American students, Alaska Native students, um, Filipinos, Korean, Thai, Samoan, um, Colombian, Mexican, and some of these are first generation uh, immigrants, some of these uh, are second generation, their parents are, are, are immigrants. Um, but this is kind of a typical classroom uh, for me, and I remind them that they should get to know each other because not a lot of, you know, not every college classroom in the United States looks like uh, this in terms of the, the range of backgrounds and, and experiences. Um, and it makes for a very dynamic uh, learning environment, particularly for a sociology uh, class. Now, the, the, the final thing I'll note is this is a bit of a fabrication. Um, this is not what my classes usually look like. Actually, this is what my classes usually look like uh, this time of the year. Um, this has nothing to do with diversity. It has to do with me being long-winded, uh, and I think I've achieved that again today. Uh, so thank you very much. <laughs> I have a question about um, the broader census um, terminology. Um, this census term, America, who was that meant for? Oh. There's, uh, there's Alaskan American, but when it's just American, I find that a little bit confusing. And that's not a category. That was from the open ended response. So that is, oh, that is, that is people. When asked, they're saying their their ancestry is American, and um, th there's an interesting paper there uh, in terms of of, of you know, who's most likely to identify as American, just just plain American. I, and I can tell you, I've looked at the the um, the statistics uh, for the estimates at the state level, and the highest percentages of of people who say you know, who say when asked American are in the deep south of the United States. Uh, there are very high rates uh, of, and there's a story there. I'm not sure exactly what that story is, but there is a story there. But yeah, that's from the open-ended response. That's, that's people identifying that themselves. Makes more sense. Yeah. There's all sorts of terminology. Um, uh, Native American is also is also used. Yeah, um, most of the the American Indians that I've known you prefer the term Indian, um, and then the Alaska Native population is, you know, it's a yeah. There's different terminology in terms of. Yeah, and there's a variety of different. Um, um, and what the census tries to do is use what's the, the common terminology. And, and actually, um, uh, there, there's, there's some terminology that they get criticized for because they keep it. Uh, there, there's a lot of um, discussion and continuing discussion under um, you know, black African American. They still have on the, on the form. Yes, on yeah. <laughs> um, and their argument is that many uh, older African Americans still use that terminology. Uh, so you, you'll get some, some terms that seem very, very outdated, but they're trying to capture a swath of, of people from different age groups. But you do see they do change the terminology over time. In fact, it's fascinating looking at how the, the census has changed, how it uh, deals with race from 1790 to present day. It's just amazing when you look at it. It's, uh, it's a whole kind of history project in and of itself, looking at those changes. No, um, not that far back, but I have, I, the first, the first uh, enumeration in Alaska was uh, 1880. Um, and I've looked at, at uh, um, and I can actually get you the, the, the documents, our, um, the state has them up on, online, um, but it was essentially <laughs> one guy, uh, uh, and, um, uh, and he kind of went off on his own. Uh, he was uh, kind of sanctioned by the US government, but kind of not. 
and it reads kind of it reads very differently than a census document would today. It, it reads more like a travelogue, but it's it's fascinating because he spent you know a great deal of time in very very remote areas in a canoe and and trying to count people. Um, I won't vouch for um, the accuracy of the data back in 1880, but it's a, it's a wonderful read, and it's a, unlike a lot of present day census documents, there's far more text than numbers. Um, so a, there's a lot of description in it, but that, that's the first uh, census data that I'm aware of is 1880 in Alaska. Was it more of a Western type uh, Anchorage at that, um, at that, that time was, it was basically native populations, the Nana um, populations. Um, most of the, the stuff that I've read from that, that's a, uh, census uh, enumerator uh, was in the Kenai Peninsula, which is nearby. And there you see uh, a combination of, of Russian uh, and native villages. Um, there's even one area which had a, a significant number of, of uh, Chinese laborers um, in uh, one of the fisheries. Uh, so it's, 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 a, um, it's really pre-Anchorage uh, as an urban, uh, urban area, but there's some you know, fascinating sort of sort of uh, information in that, uh, in that first attempt at enumeration. Uh, I have one quick question about the U.S. Census. Uh, it's kind of I changed should, quite a bit over the years. I should, uh, so they're not frowning at me anymore. <laughs> Could you repeat the first part? The U.S. Census that you're, you're talking about has changed quite a bit over history. Over the first part of it. I was curious what motivated this. Was it, was it government mandate or? Often it's um, uh, the reality of changing demographics, um, and often there's political pressure. Uh, the, the, the census enumerators are professional demographers, but the, the, the realities of the census, you know, it is a government um, agency. Uh, so you, for example, uh, prior to, I think, uh, 1990, you couldn't get some of those, those um, refines, uh, uh, refined Asian origin groups. Uh, well, there were some protests by uh, Asian groups saying, we want to be able to identify you know, our own cultural heritage on the U.S. Census form. The same thing occurred with the, multi, you know, the biracial, multiracial option. There were people who you know, identified as as uh, mixed race or biracial, and there was a growing movement that why do we have to, you know, pin our, our identity on a single box? Why can't we choose more than one box? So the application of political pressure and protests can change how this, the census does business. Um, I should mention the, um, I do have this slide. This is, this is in the works um, uh, for potentially the next census of a different way of, of recording race and ethnicity doing away with the two, the, the two questions and including this array of, of different groups. It, it's not clear that that's going to occur. Again, this is, there are some politics in, in, involved in this, but I think this would be a vastly superior uh, way to address race and ethnicity rather than these two, two questions and um, some of the terminology that they use. It's somewhat of a confusing layout of the answer that came out. Yeah, and it's been confusing to respondents as well, which is the worst because you want you want uh, precise measurement in, in these sor sorts of things. Uh, the, uh, I know with the, the race and um, Hispanic origin uh, items, they originally had the race item first and the Hispanic origin I item second, and Latinos were reading the race item and saying, well, I'm not here, so I'm other. Um, so you had a very large number of Latinos identifying as other. When you put the Hispanic question first and the race question uh, second, then Latinos are far more likely to choose something other than other uh, as their racial identity. So the question order matters and there's all sorts of survey methodologies that matter in terms of getting these data. Other questions? Great, well, thank you. Uh, thank you, it's been an honor. Thank you. Thank you.